or you can live in a state of abject terror. Now, maybe the best summation of this I've seen was posted by a dude I know only as a random factor. This is a comment taken from the biology blur uh, blog for Ingo, and he says, the mind is an endless committee meeting with barely relating employees sitting around a table, each with their own concerns. One of them is screaming, we're all going to die, at random intervals, distracting and throwing off the others, some of them are desperately trying to get us laid. <laughs> Religion takes that going to die from a lot in the corner and keeps them busy so the rest of us can get on with the more important thing. Where it goes bad is when religion starts to gather more and more of the other employees into its corner, taking them out of the game. Once the guy trying to get laid, he gets waylaid by thou shalt not. It's game over. <laughs> oh, and occasionally he gets his science done, so it helps us get laid. <laughs> denial or abject terror. I think most of us choose denial. Uh, speaking for myself, I know intellectually that I'm going to die, but I do not feel it in my gut. Now, I don't really, I haven't really internalized it. I may be an atheist, but that does not mean that I can actually come to grips with my own mortality. The neocortex allows us to imagine our death. The brainstem, which is much, much older, keeps us from really believing it. So in my gut, I think that I'm immortal. And I think that most of us do. Now, there is at least some evidence that we are programmed for optimism. At least people diagnosed as clinically depressed have been shown to be more empirically objective about their own personal circumstances than so-called emotionally healthy people. <laughs> Think about that. It is only the clinically depressed who see things as they really are. <laughs> and it's pretty easy to see why, too. I mean, uh, after all, the moment you really grok the odds stacked against you, you're probably just going to want to you know, open your veins in a warm bath. I mean, what's the point? And then how many genes are you going to leave to the next generation? So in a world where, through most of our evolutionary history, most of us didn't even survive to breeding age, success depends, for an intelligent, self-aware species, at least in part, upon self-delusion, fitness over truth, once again. Now, all this existential dread is enough to make even some very smart people just go back and decide that they were just better off believing in God, after all. Francis Collins, he was the head of one of the human genome projects, the least successful one. Uh, he's currently um, Obama's science advisor, I believe. Um, both an evangelical Christian and smart enough to have nailed the gene for muscular dystrophy. But if you actually read this book, if you actually read his reasoning or why he believes in God, these reasons are downright retarded. <laughs> <laughs> he, saw, he saw the Holy Trinity in a frozen waterfall once. He steals C.S. Lewis's argument that that mankind does not have needs for things that don't exist. You know, we get hungry and there's food. We get horny and there's the internet. And therefore, <laughs> because we have a need for God, then God must, ipso facto, be every bit as real as hookers and altar boys. Uh, he, he argues that natural selection can't account for altruism. He says that, that every non-selfish act contributes contradicts evolutionary theory, which is pretty much analogous to saying that every blowjob disproves the role of sex in reproduction. <laughs> Read the book. It's, it's a real eye-opener. But Collins is by no means a stupid man. I think there's really something else going on here, some kind of cognitive short circuit. You know how when you're dreaming, you accept completely absurd events without question. They seem perfectly normal, and it's only after you've woken up that you start realizing how whacked out it all was. Apparently, there's some kind of logical quality control circuitry that, that makes you skeptical when you're awake, but which shuts down when you're asleep. I don't know, maybe it's something like that. You've got other smart folks. You've got Ray Kurzweil. You've got Hans Morbett, for example. They turn to science a savior. Uh, you've got the singularity, the rapture of the nerds in which we all attain immortality by being uploaded into immortal machinery. Or nanotech saves the day, or cheap fusion um, solves all our energy needs. Space aliens come down in their flying chandeliers and play childlike songs to us and say, save our asses. Um, a couple of folks have actually taken a stab at combining explicitly science and religion. Frank Tipler is a specialist in uh, global general relativity out of Tulane. A few years back, he wrote an entire book in which he claimed to have developed an attestable hypothesis for the existence of the Judeo-Christian God and, uh, and an afterlife. Of three quarters of this book was equations. I read them even though I didn't understand them. If I'm getting the thumbnails correctly, what he's basically saying 
is that God is the mother of all supercomputers powered by thermal shear stress by being bounced on the edge of a supermassive black hole during the big crunch <laughs> at the end of time into which we will all be resurrected down to the subatomic level in the mother of all emulation models. <laughs> now nobody takes Tipler's theory seriously anymore, if they ever did. Uh, current data now tells us that, uh, at least this year, uh, that there isn't even going to be a big crunch, that the universe is just going to keep flying apart into heat death. But there was reason to be a little skeptical of Tipler um, even before that data came down the pipeline.